Right guys, welcome. So it is cold, so we're going to keep it as quick as possible, around about 40 minutes. Um, there's a lot to go through in goal setting and nutrition. We're going to touch on goal setting because it is really key for when you get into the nutrition side of things. But those of you, those guys who are on the personal training program, I'm actually releasing Monday nights. We'll be doing a monthly webinar as well where we'll be covering different topics and we're going to go the first one we're going to go into some real key deep goal setting stuff nutrition is the biggest mindfuck going for everybody because you anybody you look at on instagram is going to tell you you should be doing it x y and z all like they've created the new way of eating the new way of dieting this brand new science and it's absolute crap there is one overriding principle in nutrition for 99% of the population, and that is energy balance, which we'll get into. But first of all, goal setting. The first question for you all is, and I want you to raise some hands here as well, who wants to try and change their bodies? So I don't want to work with people who want to try and do it. I want to work with people who've got the mindset that they're going to do it. I am going to do it. Because if you go into something saying you're going to try it, that's all you're going to do. If you are going to do it, yeah, it was, yeah. Yeah, absolutely it was. It is a trick question, but it shows the mindset that you have to have. You cannot half ask things if you truly want results, yeah? So when you set off on something, you are going to do it. The second question is, how bad are things going to get before you genuinely make a change? Because we can all sit there wishing we were and sit there feeling crap because we've just smashed another box of hobnobs or we're going to do something about it, yeah? So you've got to think a bit, how bad, how crap do you feel how crap are you going to carry on feeling? So you go, right, you draw a line in the sand, you go, right, this is it. And quite a lot of people who are coming here now have drawn a line in the sand and gone, right, that is it. That is where it begins. So keep that mindset. From this point forward, keep that mindset. Invest in yourself, not just money, not just paying for this place, but invest in yourself, whether it's your time, your energy, whatever it is, yeah? So let's be clear on your goal setting. Goal setting is the first stage to any transformation because if you don't know where you want to go, how are you supposed to know what path you're supposed to follow? So when we're looking at goals, who's going to be brave enough to put the hand up and tell me what your goal is? What is their goal for being here? In fact, I've never met you before. It's Rebecca, isn't it? Marvellous. Right. Just because I've never met you, tell me what it is. Just to feel better in yourself. Just to feel better in yourself. Why is that important to you? Because I have anxiety and depression. Okay. I'll help balance it out. You're not the only one in here who suffers anxiety and depression. Just so you know what company you're in, I had to leave a 17-year police career because of anxiety. And it, I was literally in bed for almost a year with it. It crippled me. And I had to leave, and that's why I opened this place, because I couldn't carry on anymore. So trust me, you're in good company. Now, what an awful lot of people will do is think about the reaction of other people towards them as their driving force. Now, I'm not going to put pressure on people in here delving that deep. I do that with some of my PT clients. We delve deep into the whys. You know what? I want to lose some weight because I don't want to walk down the beach and feel stupid. I want to walk down the beach. I want to be able to wear a pair of shorts on holiday because I'm sick of wearing pants. There's two different goals there entirely. One, you're doing for yourself. One is about wearing a pair of pants or a pair of shorts, sorry, instead of pants when you're in 40 degree heat. The other one you're doing because you're, you're worried about what somebody else is going to be thinking. And bear this in mind. If you walk down the street and you see a couple there 
and you're in a crop top and they look and go, Jesus Christ, you look disgusting. And you look at them, you think, I know what they're thinking. Then you walk down the street and you've lost five, six stone. You've still got a little bit to go. And you walk down the street and that same couple are still going to go, oh, what are they wearing that for? You can't please everybody. They have no idea that you've lost five, six, seven, eight stone. They're looking at you, what they see. Who genuinely cares? What difference does it make what that person thinks to your life? They're going to have forgotten about you long after you forget, long before you forget about them. So we need to find a goal that works for us. Joe, picking on you for one that we had last year. Joe had never been on holiday and worn a pair of shorts. That's why I used that one before. She wanted to wear a pair of shorts because she wanted to go for a walk with her husband in boiling hot water, uh, boiling hot uh, water, yeah, <laughs> boiling, boiling hot conditions. Because for years, she's just worn pants. That's a goal for you. There's a huge, huge difference, yeah? So when you're looking at these goals, think about where that's going to take you. So, <clears throat> like I said, we're going to do that um more workshops online as well. But also think about what your success is going to feel like. What does it look like and what does it feel like? How are you going to feel when you fit into that size 14, that size 12, that size 16, that size 18? How is it going to feel? Keep those emotions in check and that's where you begin to find your why, yeah? I've pushed through in this business for six years, changed, taken some really big decisions, changed my model because I am absolutely determined to show my nine-year-old lad that you can do and achieve anything you want, even if you want to swap halfway through your life, yeah? There's my why, which is stronger than anything that can ever be. So you find a strong why and there will be nothing that can stop you. I'm currently dieting like mad because Sam in there will kick the crap out of me if I don't follow her diet with her. Um, that's just fear. Right then. So let's get into two types of nutritional choices. The There is a plethora of choices in there, but we're going to look predominantly today at quick fixes and of the longevity approach, so taking your time a little bit more. Who are quick fixes for? Who are they not for? Why would you do them? Why wouldn't you do them? Now, for a long time, I'm the type of trainer who will constantly reassess what I'm putting out there. What I put out there when I first started doing six-week challenges when we were in the unit over there is entirely different from what I do now because I've changed my mind. I've researched. There's new research coming out. I'm not afraid to put my hand up and go, you know what? That doesn't work anymore. It was right then because that was all I knew, but it's not anymore. So a quick fix. So when I say a quick fix, I mean a really, really restrictive calorie, uh, really, really restrictive calorie diet. So you're going really low and your food choices are very, very limited. That can work for a couple of people. One, Somebody who has tried and honestly tried to diet before and they just cannot get it. They can't do it because they just can't avoid reaching for the slice of cake, the biscuits and things like that. And in which case you get a set, uh, set degrees of food and go, here's your food. Here is what you choose from. You eat nothing else apart from those in these quantities. That can also include things like meal replacement shakes. Now, there are two or three people in here who potentially that would work for. One, I know specifically, is going to do it, and I've got two other people who are doing it because I've tried everything else to find a way to work. They're going to be on a massively restrictive calorie, which is a uh, diet, which is going to cause dramatic weight loss. And that's great. No. So yeah, I'm going to get to that. Yeah. So it's not a long-term strategy. The reason you would choose to do that is if you, your goals are up here, this mountain of goals. So if you have, let's say 10 stone to lose, me turning around to you and saying, right, I'm going to put you on this nice, controlled, balanced diet. You're going to look at it and think, holy shit, that is going to take me about three years to achieve. That for anybody is going to mess with your head. But if I turn around to you and say, I'm going to get you to lose a stone within a month, 
We might carry that on for maybe two months, but that's it. Because that is not sustainable for anybody because we will all have parties, birthdays, Christmas, holidays, whatever it will be, where we have to down tools and relax. When I go on holiday at Christmas time, I eat like I've never eaten in my life because I love food. Yeah. So a, a harsh diet like that wouldn't work for me. The important thing with a quick fix like that, that it is managed as you come out, because if you go from a hugely restrictive diet to one, then when you're allowed to eat all these things you haven't done, you will start to gorge and you will bounce back to where you are. And this is why I get so, so irritated with all these people selling on Facebook, Instagram, you know, all these quick fixes, the potions, the pills, all stuff like that. They have zero training and they have zero idea of the psychology of things behind this. They will just continue to farm this crap out to you. Yeah. So it, you have to think about how hard, how much of a target you have and whether a quick fix is right for you. It is a quick win and it helps. Important to note, there was a study done a few years ago, though, 90, and it goes on to the sustainability of something like that. 95% of people who tried to hit a very restrictive diet come off that. And what happens then? They bounce back. And you, it is quite a big statistic that's thrown out there, but it was done from a study where they had a, gr a large group of people who were considered to be obese and they put them on this highly restrictive diet and then just left them to it. And they all bounced back. There was only 5% of them who managed to keep some of the weight off. So the one that I prefer is, wherever I've lost myself here, da -da 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 -da, longevity. And this is what I call cognitive flexibility. One where you're giving, we're working on the 70-30 balance. One thing I want you to do is get rid of the idea that there is good and bad food. There is not. There is wholesome, nutritious food, and there's real life where you're going to enjoy the pizza. You're going to enjoy the kebab. You're going to enjoy the chips. I did it the other night, uh, last night with Sam. Um, she, we've all had our tea together, but I just desperately wanted some chips. I waited till she'd gone. She's putting the kids to bed, and I have a few chips to keep it out of the way of her because, you know, she'd have killed me otherwise. Uh, <laughs> but... I have that 70-30 balance in mind. I have a target of getting down to around about 94 kilos, getting rid of my Christmas weight and the weight that I've put on over the last 12 months where my priorities have been different. My priorities have not been training. It's been driving the business. It's been uh, me and Sam moved in together. It's blending a family. It's all these things where we're, we're you know, that take priority. So I know that my target there is I can reach it with this balance. I don't need a highly restrictive diet. Um, we need to create habits that suit your lifestyle. We need to create habits that will work for you. So there is no point. Me, if you want to go out at nighttime on a Friday night, sink 20 pints, have a 24-inch pizza, there is no point me turning around to you and say, you're not going out drinking and you're not eating pizza because they're clearly two things that you really, really enjoy. And I take this from a real-life example from when I had a client a few years ago over in the other unit. He literally went out and had 20 pints on every single Friday night and had a pizza. So my first tactic was him, with him was to begin to change some of his behavior. So instead of 20 pints and a pizza, it went to 20 pints and a burger. And that saved him a thousand calories a week. And then we slowly begin to just change those things. And I'll go, get onto the smaller details later on. A 70-30 balance where your brain, the cognitive side of your brain, the thinking, the, the, we have that flexibility so that you know that you are not breaking your diet if you go out and have a burger. I know I'm not breaking my diet if I sit down with my nine-year-old and have a McDonald's because it's built into it. It means that I'm not restricting myself so much that I'm craving it and I go and smash three Big, three big Macs in a go. I choose a hamburger, fries, and a Coke Zero. I'm still enjoying it with my lad. I'm still showing him that, that you don't have to starve yourself. And he loves sitting with his dad having a McDonald's. 
and he eats more than me. <laughs> so we work on that balance. We will have at points a 30-70 balance. If you go on holiday, you might have 30% nutrition where you go, you go up to that all-you-can-eat buffet and you go, shit, I better have some salad as well. Uh, but the rest of it is ice cream, it's cakes, it's really nice, lovely food. Do that for a week. There's no harm. When you come back, you just revert back to the 70-30. And this is where you get, where if, you're, if your aim is weight loss, you get that one, one and a half, two pounds a week. If you, if you lose one to one and a half pounds a week, if your target is weight loss, then you've got that balance right. So we also need to be honest with ourselves about how we got into the conditions we're in. There is absolutely no point trying to point the finger at somebody else. There is absolutely no point in saying, well, it's, you know what, I've had kids. And no, at the end of the day, we made the decision to eat. We made the decision. We know damn well that eating our fourth McDonald's of the week or our third takeaway of the week is not, uh, is not going to work towards our goals. We've all made those decisions. And yes, there are aggravating factors. I've done it. I know damn well that when I go to the chippy on a Friday, me and Gary this year, we had one week where I think we went to the chippy three times. We sat there going, what the hell are we doing? But we made those conscious decisions. So let's not blame anybody else for them. You made the decision. You can make the decision to reverse it. Because if you can't be honest with yourself, you can't be honest with me when I'm sat down in one-to-ones with you trying to talk about what's gone wrong. We know that most excessive food comes from sugars. Most of our excesses come from sugars, and they can come from varying points. Carbs, alcohol, the odd biscuits, Costa, Starbucks, they are a nightmare for sugars and excess calories. One large cream latte, uh, a milk latte, is the best part of 300 calories. That's insane. For a man like me who has... 2,400 calories if I'm in a deficit, if I'm dieting, that's a massive chunk out of my day. So for some of you guys here who are probably on, you know, who should be eating maybe 15, 1,600 calories, that's monumental. So I'm not saying don't have them, be aware of them. Um, unaccounted for calories, your, uh, the odd biscuit that you grab, the ketchup, the brown sauce, the mayonnaise, all these little things tot up. Because if you top them up over a week, holy shit. And that'll come to one of the graphs I want to show you in a minute. So as you're guessing, today is much more about behaviors because most of us know what we should and shouldn't be eating. And, you know, the, we will point you in the right direction if you don't. So the success in any transformation depends on our energy balance. That's what I spoke to at the very beginning. If you push either way, too far, so you eat too much, you put weight on, you eat too little, you'll lose weight, but then you will bounce back. So it's finding that balance that we talked about. And this is where the principle of core four, those of you who are on the personal training program will, and those of you who have maybe looked at the videos, because I know half of you bloody well haven't. I know Victoria, you have though, haven't you? Yeah, swat. <laughs> core four is the primary driver behind everything we do. And even if you don't count calories, if you get the core four in, you will, uh, you will begin to feel healthier. Two to two and a half liters of water every day. The body is 80% water. If we're not replenishing that, you will know about it. And you'll know because your pee is probably orange, you're not peeing as much, or your pee stinks. And it's dead, dead easy. They're the three things you will know. You should be going to the toilet a good three or four times a day. Number ones I'm talking about. Number twos, depends how your guts work. <laughs> but that's for another day. And it genuinely is for another day. That is about talking about gut health. Number two, goodness in, green veg. How many of you honestly can put your hand up and say that you have enough green veg? Some of you will, but most of us won't. Yeah? Yeah? Because we always leave it to the last. 
And we, most of us will eat our teas when we're hungry. And the order it usually goes in is smash the carbs because that gives us the most amount of energy as quick as we can. Then we go to the protein because, you know, the meat's probably in a nice sauce or a burger or something like that. And then we leave the green shit to last because nobody likes eating grass. So try it a different way. Go for your veg first. Eat a little bit of your veg, then go for your protein, then have some of the carbs that are on there. And then repeat it in that order. Repeat it in that order. It takes 20 minutes from the moment a food hits your mouth, it goes to the gut and sends a, a signal to the brain to tell us we're full. So if we've done that with carbs, first of all, we've smashed a load of calories and not got a massive amount in return. We've got a load of energy, but low in protein, and most of it is low in vitamins and minerals because it's the pastas, it's the processed stuff, it's things like that. So hit your veg first. We've got vitamins and minerals coming in. Then go for your protein. We need the protein to repair the body, to build muscle, to keep our entire bits for our skin, to regrow everything there, and then go for the carbs. I'm not saying you have to do this. It is all these talks that I do is about giving you tools, shove them in your toolbox and use them. Then we've got good sleep. And I can guarantee a shitload of you are going, I don't sleep very well. And there's probably a lot of things you can do. One, switch the TV off at least half an hour before you go to sleep. Put your mobile phone out of your bedroom. Because if we wake up in the night, what is the first thing we grow, go for in the middle of the night? Be quiet, Joe. Do as I say, not as I do. <laughs> Isn't that the first thing we do? If we wake up in the middle of the night, we go, oh, and then all of a sudden we're scrolling on Facebook. Why do we do it? I do it. I do it. But what I do now is I move my phone further away. Because I use it as an alarm clock. I leave it as far away from my bed as I can. And that helps me. I try my best not to scroll. Don't get me wrong. I do it because you do it out of boredom. You're TikToking. You, you want to giggle. You do whatever. Clo get some blackout blinds. Get rid of the light pollution. Yeah? Fresh bed sheets. All these little things that will help us have a more comfortable sleep. Exercise. Whether that is going for a walk or training in a gym or going for a swim or whatever it is. If you can get that in, your body will become a little bit more tired. So you'll probably sleep better. All these things affect each other. If you begin to exercise, your sleep will get a bit better. If you get your diet, your uh, goodness in, so your vegetables, you'll be able to relax a little bit more. <clears throat> and I'm going to go on to one of the diagrams in a second in, in relation to all these, uh, how these all uh, small things work for each other. If you're having two to two and a half liters of water, your organs are working better. They're processing everything so much better. So your body is not as stressed. They all have a knock-on effect with each other. Just keep it moving round and round and round. So that brings me to the first diagram. Now I know unfortunately some of you uh, can't see it just because of the, the pens here. So I'll try and go over a little bit in the red there. So we're talking about not making monumental changes to our diets. We don't need to make monumental changes, most of us, because we know that what we're eating is good and what we're eating is bad. We need to make smaller changes. And this is how smaller changes can make a massive difference over a period of time. So we have here, in fact, let me bring it to the center. So we have here your current trajectory you're beginning to put weight on the black line there and you're thinking we need to make massive changes to drop it down here. So I want you to imagine a cruise ship traveling along and it changes its direction by one degree. That one degree here is you putting two to two and a half liters of water in your body. You're not going to notice an awful lot of change straight away. You're not going to see a directional change from that cruise ship straight away. But give it a couple of days and that cruise ship is beginning to go off course. Give it a couple of days and that water is beginning to have a positive effect on your body. It's not a massive change. Wake up in the morning, have a pint of water 
have another one at dinner time, have another one at tea time. You're virtually there. Three times, 10 seconds a day, and you've made a monumental change to how your body works. Number two, get goodness in, your green vegetables. Stick some green vegetables on your plate twice a day. That's it. It's not a big thing. We can all buy a bag of frozen veg, throw it into a, a Tupperware container, or boil it, or maybe even eat it cold. I don't know if anybody does, but I like cold broccoli. <laughs> but we, again, it's not a massive change. All of a sudden, that cruise ship has changed direction a little bit more. Your body is going, holy shit, what's this? I've got water and I've got vitamins. I've not heard of this before. Where's my beer? Then all of a sudden, number three, we throw in a good seven to eight hours sleep every single day. And all of a sudden, your body is beginning to respond. You're feeling better. You've got more energy. You've got more concentration. You've got more focus. You're happier. You've got more energy for the kids. You're not as irritable. Let's throw in a little bit of training. That's going to make us sleep even better because we're pushing. We're in an environment full of people who are all striving for that success. Four changes to your lifestyle will send that cruise ship off to another country. It will send your body off to a different direction entirely. It does not have to be big changes. Who remembers the Sky Cycling team about 10, 15 years ago? Their entire ethos was making tiny percentage changes. So they changed the setup of the front cog by literally 0.5 of a millimeter. They changed the setup the position of the rider by literally two millimeters. They changed the pitch of the rider. They changed the shape of the helmet. All these little things turned them into the best cycling team that has ever been on this planet. Small changes work. So let's talk about foods briefly. And it is briefly because it is a big topic. Food has a thermogenic value. In other words, different foods take more, the body has to work harder to digest them. The higher in protein your food is, the harder your body has to work to break it down, which means your body is burning more calories by simply digesting food. If you're buying highly processed crap food, it is designed to go through your system really quick and it will literally flow through you. You've had all the enzymes taken out of it and it just flows through you. So all the, vit the vitamins and minerals that are in there haven't had time to digest, they just flow through you. You get some quality from it. However, if you go for something like a chicken breast and you have a chicken breast, that single, what we call a single use food, you eat it and your body begins to break it down and it's burning more calories than if it was a highly processed chicken nugget from farm foods that cost you a quid. Yeah? So they're the scales that we're looking at. I'm nothing wrong. Trust me, there is nothing wrong with one pound farm foods chicken nuggets because they taste ace. But they're not doing a great deal for me in terms of my diet. Yeah? Again, that balance. If my son's eating them and he's got a few left, as long as I've got the rest of my uh, diet in check, I'm going to enjoy a couple of them because they're good, because they're ace with ketchup. Can't beat ketchup. I'm into my mayonnaise at the moment, I've got to say. Right then. So with thermogenic foods is something to think about. The higher the protein value, the better it is. The higher the thermogenic value is. Yeah? Don't want to delve into the, the complexities of it, but that is the rule. <clears throat> Diagram two, I'm going to draw on here, and I'm going to show you the effects on your body, on your energy system, sorry, of four different types of foods. High sugar foods, high carb shoes, shoes, foods, high vegetable based foods or meals, and high protein. So, if we've got, this is where I have to keep checking here. If we look at this graph here, along the up here is your energy. Here is time throughout the day, 24 hours. Here is roughly where we want our energy values. 
We want them to be roughly about that all day long. So we've got roughly the same energy. Yeah, there are peaks and troughs, but that's where we go. Now, I got into a bit of an argument on social media many years ago because I imagine, yeah, <laughs> because I constantly used to see the same girl about 12, 13 years old, leaving her mum and dad or parents, whoever it was, flat with a massive can of Red Bull every single morning. And I got really riled up with it. If we take that, and if you look at your stereotypical white van man builders, you will see a shitload of Red Bulls all across the dashboard amongst everything else. It's that general kind of stereotypical diet we're looking at. If I have a Red Bull in the morning because I'm tired, it's going to spike my energy. Bang, I'm straight up there. The problem is it is full of it's full of stuff that we are really going to struggle to process. So what happens? Then our energy drops right down and we're struggling because then we're like that shit. I need some more. So I'm going to reach for something else. I'm going to reach for a Mars bar, a pack of crisps, something high sugar because I need to get back up there because otherwise my boss is going to kick my ass because I'm not working on the building site as fast as I should be. So we spend all day up and down, up and down. And then we go to the pub. We have a pint. We have crisps. We have a pie. We have whatever. That's what happens to our high sugar diet. Then we have a high carb diet where we're relying on chips, we're relying on potatoes, we're relying on pies. Not quite as severe, but carbs have a lot of sugars. And if we're looking at processed foods, we're looking at highly destructive sugars. So again, we see this. Exactly the same rhythm, perhaps not as bad, but we're still relying on sugars to power our day. Now, let's look at something where we have a balanced meal, where we do have our veg, where we do have our protein. We're going to have a breakfast that has got a decent protein value or something that isn't highly sugared, maybe a protein yogurt, maybe egg on toast, something like that. We're going to have our energy and then we're going to dip a little bit. We're going to have our energy, but we're going to dip. And that we're quite happy with because at that point we go, you know what? I'm going to have my snack now, or I'm going to have my meal that I've prepared. So I'm not having to go to Tesco's and grab a Mars bar because I haven't prepped myself a little bit. Then we've got our high protein foods. Exactly the same line with the energy values as the green, high vegetable, highly nutritious meals. So that is what we're doing to our body when we're constantly relying on the crisps, the chocolate, the drinks, all those things there. So only another five, 10 minutes, guys. I know it is cold. Timings of meals are not important. Everybody, oh God, I know I've got to have breakfast at this time. I've got to have, I've got to eat my meal straight after I've trained. I've got to eat it just before training. It makes absolutely no difference. Your body will ask you. It will tell you when you're hungry. You will know when you're going to get hungry. Well, I should be eating it at least four hours. You've got to eat at least four hours before 10 o'clock. There's no eating after eight o'clock. How does that work if you're working nights? How do, I was in the best condition I've ever been in when I was working nights in the police. I'm rock, rock, rocking around at 4% body fat. It's never going to happen again, by the way, ever. Um, but I was eating at all God knows what time in the morning, yeah? It makes no difference at all. Your body will ask you when it wants food. Do you need to count calories? And again, this is a huge subject. And the answer is no, you don't. The vast majority of us just need to be responsible for what we're eating. The vast majority of us know that picking up that Mars bar when I've already had a chippy today, I've already had an ice cream, probably isn't the way we want to go. We do, however, need to be calorie aware. So simply picking up a donut and going, oh, it's only, it's only 100 calories, that, it must be about 100 calories. When you look at the packet, and it's probably the best part of 400. Uh, I think it's the Krispy Kremes. Um, some of theirs are the best part of 400 calories. I mean, I, I could smash a box of them quite happily, but I'd, do, do, I'd probably give myself a heart attack with them. But be calorie aware. 
go into the supermarket, if you're having to, look at the calories. Christ, well, I've got one sandwich choice here, which looks amazing, but it's 800 calories. Or I've got one here that's 400 calories that's going to let me sit down with my family at nighttime and have some guilt-free treats. Be calorie aware. The vast majority of us, how, however, will have to calorie count for a certain period of time so that you can get it into your head that you are calorie aware. Because uh, there is a, there's a data, there was research done a while ago uh, that shows that we will over or underestimate calories in certain food groups by up to 50%. So you could be supposedly aiming for 1,500 calories when you've actually just smashed 2,000 and you can't figure out why the hell you're putting weight on. So, uh, but, uh, but, uh, but, uh, diagram three, final one, guys. You cannot out-train a bad diet. So if I'm going to McDonald's every day, if I'm having a chippy every day, and I'm having a massive, great big bowl of cornflakes every day, I am not going to be able to out-train that unless I spend about four hours a day on a treadmill. And I don't know about you, I don't have four hours a day to spend working it off. So when we are looking at a calorie deficit and the reasons for training, training does not give us the calorie deficit we need to lose weight. It's what we do in the background. When you're away from here, when, when I'm not looking over your shoulder, if you want to know what you should be eating, imagine I'm stood there in your, in your kitchen watching you. <laughs> Imagine that, Carly. <laughs> so if I'm stood there, does anyone remember a few years ago there was a, a really big fat loss program where he would move in with the person for a month and every single one of them lost weight. Every single one of them lost weight. And every single one of them would have come to me if they were in here and said, I don't know why I'm not losing weight. I'm just, I'm trying everything. Guess what? As PTs, we know you're lying. We know you're talking absolute shit. You might not think you are, but we know you are. Yeah? So, if you look at this small sec section here, if you were to look at your week's worth of calories, that is probably the amount of a deficit you get from training. It is a small percentage.